Hello. <laughs> now you had your coffee and everything is fine, right? <laughs> now we can talk about uh, the topic of machine learning and deep learning in uh, move, movement imaginary BCI. I, I made a video. Let uh, let me show you the introductory video, and then we talk. In the vast expanse of neuroscience and technology, there exists a fascinating convergence, a junction where the human brain and cutting edge tech unite. This is the realm of brain computer interfaces or BCIs. Among the various types of BCIs today, we delve into the fascinating world of movement imaginary BCI. Movement imaginary BCI or MIBCI is a technology that allows individuals to control external devices through the power of thought alone. Imagine the potential, a world where limitations are purely theoretical, where physical constraints do not dictate what one can or cannot do. To appreciate the intricacy of this technology, we must take a journey through the processing steps of movement imaginary BCI. It all starts with the user imagining a movement. This mental act generates specific electrical patterns in the brain, which are picked up by electroencephalography or EEG. These signals, although informative, are buried under a heap of other brain activities and noise. Hence, the second step involves pre-processing these signals to eliminate any unwanted noise and amplify the relevant data. Following pre-processing, the cleaned up signals then undergo feature extraction. In this phase, the significant characteristics of the signals, which differentiate one imagined movement from another, are identified and extracted. Once we have the distinguishing features, we proceed to the classification stage. Here, machine learning algorithms kick in to categorize the signals into corresponding movement classes. The final step is the translation of these classified signals into commands for the external device. Thus, a thought transforms into a tangible action bridging the gap between the human mind and the machine. To summarize, Movement Imaginary BCI is a revolutionary technology that merges neuroscience and technology, enabling control of external devices through imagined movements. The process involves five critical steps, signal acquisition, pre-processing, feature extraction, classification, and command translation. The potential applications of MIBCI are vast and transformative from assisting individuals with mobility impairments to providing a new mode of interaction with our digital world. As we stand on the brink of this new era, we must strive to understand and explore this fascinating technology, for it holds the promise of a future where the mind reigns supreme. As we conclude our exploration today, remember we have merely scratched the surface of this remarkable technology. The world of movement imaginary BCI is vast and ever evolving. It is a testament to the limitless potential of the human mind and the power of technology. It is a beacon guiding us towards a future where thought and action are seamlessly intertwined. Imagine a world where you're in the vast. Okay, his accent is much better than my accent, right? <laughs> So maybe it's better than uh, it talks. Um, I, I'm going through the uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence models for uh, MIBCI. I will go through some research uh, methods and then I change it to industrial application. Uh, how, how many of you have been implementing AI or ML models? Can you just... Uh, Okay, good. So, what is the most, most important issue you consider in your implementation? Can you just let me know? The most important issue. Reliability, okay. Any other suggestion? Yes. Oh, the sample size. Okay. And any other suggestion? The most important thing. There are, of course, there are very, is, there are many issues that are important. But what is the most important thing at the top of your head? Okay. So things that I'm going to talk about it would be interesting 
for you because I'm looking at it from, from a different perspective. Okay, so hang on, we will talk about that. Uh, we have uh, the MIBCI and the video talked much better than what I'm gonna do. Okay, so uh, MIBCI has, has various applications. As you already know, it can be used for communication aid for people with disabilities and motor skill training, control of ex exoskeletons, and neuro rehabilitation. And as the video said, we have various steps in this procedure. Filtering data, extracting reliable features, going through the selection of proper features, or I would say stable selection, or stability feature selection, classification and then it goes through the command for application it's a it's a general uh, classification problem right it's a it's considered as a classification there are many features in in neuroscience for that neuroscientists uh, consider for MIBCI for example uh, a reduction of the power of the mu band and beta band it, it blocks actually when, when the movement the, when the movement imagination starts it blocks the pass the passage of mu and beta band and then when when the imagination stops it increases the power in both mu and beta but it's not the case in all of the subjects so it's not something consistent okay it is one of the findings in the literature so people who work on machine learning models will consider features, uh, uh, nice features for discrimination. This is one of the nice features. And the areas that are activated uh, during MIBCI is, is pretty similar to actual movement. So it has been studied that when you do actual movement, then some of the areas of the brain are activated like similar when you are imagining the movement. So when we put electro electrode over the skull, it is possible to, you know, capture these potentials. Okay, we, we have been searching the literature for um, various ML and D, uh, deep learning methods used in MIBCI. And we limited our search between July 2000 and 2021, and we found about 780 papers, and we screened them all. So we screened 780 papers, and we had, based on the PRISMA guideline, we had eligib eligibility criteria like it must have at least one measure of accuracy, and at least an ML or a DL method. So in the peer-reviewed articles in English, we there were 780 papers. And when we analyze through the, you know, this is a framework for the Prisma and systematic analysis, we ended up with 320 papers. So we analyzed them all to see what's happening in this area for, uh, for ML and DL methods used for MIBCI. This has been a very hard work, and uh, one of the, our member is uh, Mehdi here, one of our very good students. He collaborated in this search. So, and we also found various data sets available and used as a benchmark in this procedure. So with the number of subjects and the number of studies uh, where uh, these uh, data sets were used. So we listed this here. And we also searched in recent papers to identify the data sets that were used in MIBCI, and they are listed here. So there are some benchmarks. I, I just want to talk about them and later I will bring some ideas as a limitation. Okay, so there are some benchmarks. We also analyze all of them in tables, I would say 30 pages, 
to see what they are talking about and what features they used, how many classes, the sample size, which feature selection was used, and feature reduction, which method, and in, most importantly, what are the validation frameworks and validation indices used in these papers, which is, which is the most important thing. So, if briefly, if we talk about it, we would see that if, if you categorize, you know, it's a pie diagram. In some of the papers, there were no validation. So, those people that were used during training, they just reported the, the accuracy or precision. So, they didn't have any validation. And you know, when you, when you use their model, the accuracy will drop significantly. And we had the holdout validation. This part is a light blue. The holdout validation means that you split the data set into two independent or and you train on the first data set, and you test on the other data set, and you don't repeat it. Well, as a matter of fact, holdout validation is vice versa, is both sides. So you have to do it also vice versa. You have to train on the test and test it on the train, but they don't do it at all. It is always possible to run your model in order to have a good accuracy on the test set by just random permutation of the samples. So it is highly possible that these results cannot be generalized because you run it on the computer and you leave it. When you reach good results, you report it, right? This is something that most of the people do. Okay, so this is not also reliable. Leave one out and k-fold validation. Okay, k-fold validation, cross-validation. If the number of folds are more than four, can be considered reliable. So when you see a paper published in the field of MIBCI and the number of cross-validation fold is less than five, it is highly possible that they ran until they reach a good accuracy. But it is proven that if the number of folds are five or higher, this, is, this, is, this, this possibility reduces, okay? And the number of movement classes in all of these papers, most of the people focus on the two class problem, right? Like right leg and left leg, okay? And as I said, holdout validation is a source of type three error. I mean, we have three types of errors. The first one, type one. The second one, type two, it is, it is related to the power. But the third one, the type three, is like rejecting null hypothesis with the wrong reason. It's like running your code on the data and permuting samples in order to reach high accuracy. It is the source of type three error. We have type four and five and further errors, but we usually focus on the first two. Okay, so what I have been doing is to categorize everything here as a challenge for the ML and DL methods in MIBCI. I, I like categorization a lot. It's like, it's like a mind mapping, right? So it has all of the information. The first problem is data variability and non-stationarity. Even when you repeat the MIBCI for the same subject, you cannot have the same results the accuracy would drop. We can think about it, why this happens. Okay, I have, uh, I will talk about it later also, how, how to quantify it. And so we will have a problem of generalization. You cannot generalize it for other people. You cannot even use it for the same people because the accuracy would drop the next day. 
Well, like uh, one of you said, we have limited training data. The, the sample size is very important for deep learning methods. We, they have millions of parameters to tune. So when you have seven subjects and you have some recordings, how can you make sure that you don't get overfitting? So this is also problematic. This is very different from image processing where you are able to flip the image or rotate the image in order to increase virtually the sample size. We are dealing with EEG data unless we change it to image. That has its own limitation. Okay. Well, the imbalance class, okay, it is a very it is a problematic issue in multi-class classification. Those people who are working on machine learning, they know that imbalanced multi-class classification is the hardest classification problem. But for the MIBCI, it's not really problematic because during your experiment, you will have the same number of sessions per subject, per classes, so you will have balanced data. So during... Uh, during your study, the class is balanced. You will have five sessions for the first class for a subject and five sessions for another class. But when people use your device, what happens? It is highly probable that, that they will focus on one of the classes more than the other class. And then another problem happens that is categorized by, by false discovery rate is the FDR measure that can be analyzed. So when you train your model, you use a controlled setting with imbalance data. But when people use your system in practice, it's not going to be the same as your setting. They might use one of the classes more than the other one. So the error will be amplified on that, on that class. This is one of the problems that usually happens in prosthetics, where some of the classes cannot be reliably identified, OK? Well, we have high dimensionality of the EEG signal. We have a lot of channels, and we have a lot of features, and then we should find a way to reduce it. But we, also, but, but we need to consider both temporal and spatial information, OK? Otherwise, we lose data. We have, sub, we have the issue of subject-specific models. Well, we need calibration. You cannot use a pre-trained network for MIBCI and just use it in one person. You have to calibrate it because uh, each person has different characteristics, different brain rhythms. Even the brain rhythms are different in one day than the other day. So it is, it is really variable. Well, you will have an issue of real-time processing constraint. Then you cannot use a very, very complicated deep learning methods. Then you have to use light versions and then you will have another problem of underfitting. And you have interference and noise. EEG signal is considered as the worst uh, bipotential signal in terms of amplitude and uh, power spectral density. So it's really possible that you capture noise during recording. And noise will affect the accuracy of the network. And then there is a generalization across task and environment. In different environments, your brain rhythms are different. And then your MIBCI device cannot work consistently unless you have a robust, you have robust features. And we call it, as, as you know, we call it a stability feature selection. Those features that are not changed during um, change, changing the train and test fold, and they do not change during daily life. So we, sh we should focus on a stability feature selection rather than choosing the best AI 
and ML and DL methods because they are the input. And if the input is not good, uh, doesn't matter which classifier you use. You use CNN model, EEG net, anything. It's not going to be successful. And issue of ethic privacy and interpretability and explainability. It's the one of the problems of the AI model that they are not really, you know, explainable. You cannot explain it to clinician unless you have interpretable AI. Your then you can say, okay, this is the change of the beta rhythm in the brain that is affecting the structure of my network. But they are not the most important problems. The most important problem is the lack of a standardization for assessment. Everybody uses different validation. Even for one benchmark, one benchmark data set, if you even fix your benchmark data set, the way you report your indices is very important. And people usually report indices in favor of their advantages. They report accuracy. They report like AUC or something, whatever is higher, they report it in their papers, okay? Because there is no, there is a lack of a standardization. But top of that, there is another issue. AI is subjected to medical regulation now. There are now many standards, I would say, more than 53 standards written in, uh, in various uh, regulatories, like IEEE, ESO, IEC, regarding to AI methods. And we do not really take them into account. Even in the university, we, we learn AI models. We usually do not learn which models can be used for devices that can pass regulatory issues for CE marking or FDA, because they are going to be used in practice someday, right? We are not talking about BCI just in uh, experimental condition. If you want to make it a device, and if you want to sell it, if you want to produce it, you have to pass regulatory barriers. How many of us have been thinking about uh, standards in this area? I would say maybe 35 standards are now being prepared rather than tens of standards that have been developed. So one of the main barriers in AI and ML would be regulatory issues. We do not really consider them in our implementation. We just find a good method and we just implement it. We have a lot of good toolboxes, right? We just implement it over the GPU and then it's okay. But it's not really okay. I will talk about some of these standards and I will show you some of the problems that we might encounter during our implementation. And what are the future direction in addition to medical device regulations that I will specifically talk about? It? Well, all of these are really, these are not really important. We can always improve the AI model, but if we do not really care about the day that it must pass a test, it's not gonna be useful because at some point you would like to produce your device. You know, my colleagues uh, talked about different programs, different packages, and they are all about going to the market. But if you cannot pass a test, you cannot produce it. There are some AI models, models that cannot pass the test. And if you don't know, you would focus on them and you don't even know which parameters are important during your implementation because they come from a regulatory perspective. So in addition to this, we should consider, I mean, I have a, a flowchart. I mean, that flowchart would be useful if I show you. 
in the most important com uh, companies working in the field of uh, artificial intelligence, I have, uh, I provided, uh, I think, let me see. I guess it's here. Just a second. Oh, I think I put it at the end of my presentation as a supplementary. Yes. Sorry about that. Here you can see the structure of the most famous AI companies in the world. One of the box is the ethical AI advisor and compliance officer. So this officer knows the regulations and he talks with the data scientists and ML engineers which method to use and which method not to use. Maybe the method would be very interesting in research, but in application, it cannot pass the test. So this guy knows about that. And this is important when we are working on research because sometime, someday we want to produce it, right? We just, we really don't want just to uh, do the research. So it is important and it has a very high rank in the companies. Let me go back. Okay, enhancing the performance of the device requires to know which indices are the most important ones. We should know it. And, and the other issues like handling high dimensional data is when we want to do this, we really need to know how to select a stable features that do not change during daily life so our system would be robust it is so important that now the bci devices you know now they are a specific standards on their preparation for the next year so there is a B, there are four categories of bci and they not really focus on invasive bci they mostly focus on non-invasive bci so when you are trying to work on bci you should know that there are four specific standards for BCI that is under development. So if you finish your implementation next year, you have to follow this. So there are regulation specifically for BCI. And now if you want to focus on the importance of regulation, you know, it's not like, like, you know, okay, there are, some papers it's very hard to read like ESO or this kinds of stuff no it's not like this all of the materials are helping people understand better the advantage and disadvantage of ai models and which model to implement like assessment the robustness of the neural network the neural network has to be robust and how can we assess its robustness there are specific indices for that. So it's better to read this standard because it is interesting that they even talk about the performance measures to report because uh, I don't know if you are familiar with COVID-19 papers in with machine learning, maybe millions of them were published and most of them are of no use. Some of them were retracted most of them are not useful at all and they didn't even report proper measures so now in the iso and iec standards you will have a text telling please you should report this and this and this because people don't i can show you just a two page of this one
Okay. This is part of the ISO 24029-1. You should report macro correlation coefficients rather than accuracy. How many papers have you seen in this uh, field where MCC was reported? Not so many. Because it's a robust measure. You have to report lift. Usually, Usually we consider binom a binomial distribution and we assign a, a random threshold where a random classifier can reach accuracy. And then any accuracy that you have must be higher than this. So that's a lift. How many papers in MIBCI deep learning, machine learning have seen where this, this threshold was calculated? Some of the indices are beyond this threshold. So it's like you have a random classifier, and you have to prove it's not a random classifier, OK? And then you have a meek, uh, micro and macro average, as average issues that usually people do not report because it, it shows exactly which class has the least accuracy among all the classes. People usually report the overall accuracy, and those good uh, classes, the majority good classes, they usually cover the accuracy. And then you have to also report the Cohen's Kappa as the agreement rate. You, you know Cohen's Kappa? It's a measure of agreement. And it takes out the agreement by chance and it gives you the amount of true agreement. So when you report this, people will really know what is the, the real accuracy of your method. But the point is that it's not in research, it is in application. So someday when you design your method and you want to give it to the notified body, you have to report all of these measures. So it's better to know them and use them because they are more robust and they can better identify the weakness of your method. Well, here it comes the issue that we really don't like, the statistical issue, right? We have uncertainty analysis to prove that your method is robust. And we don't like a statistics, really? Do you like it? Not really. No. OK. There are two specific standards. I mean, I told you there are more than 54 written standards, but there are two specific standards that are, I mean, if you have designed a software for, for, uh, for notified body, you might see the life cycle of the software. You have heard this, this phrase. And now we have the life cycle of the AI method. AI methods have been part of the softwares because softwares were a general term. But now AI method has its own specific life cycle and has to be implemented during the project. It is the ISO 24029-2. And you see it started in 2022. The reason that most of them started in 2021 and afterwards is because of the rubbish, rubbish, papers published in COVID-19. Many rubbish ML and DL methods were published for COVID-19 diagnosis, prognosis, and most of them are of no use. We even searched this one in, in one of this uh, a paper. We searched about 522 papers, and only five papers were correct five amount of more than 500 papers, all of them lack a level of certainty. So this is another issue. And also you have, if you wanna, if you wanna 
have C marking for your device where AI is implemented, you have to follow the IEC 23894. It's a 2023 version. Like many other medical devices that has risk assessment and quality assurance standard, now uh, artificial intelligence has its own risk management. So it has to be implemented during implement during the development and deployment phases. So what are the challenges of AI and ML model in MIBCI? No, atten not, no attention to regulatory issues and robustness issues. There have been some attempts about using ML and uh, using DL methods for MIBCI specifically. One of them is the EEGNet, right? And when you see this, you see, oh, we have convolution layers, we have a depth wise, we have this input from the data. It is so cool, no? It is so cool. You get the features without feature selection and extraction. And then at the end, you will have the classification. Let's see what the EGNet has. Another two minute video. He talks much better than I do, so. Welcome to this video explaining the structure of EEGNet, a compact convolutional neural network designed for EEG-based brain computer interfaces. EEGNet is specifically designed to efficiently process EEG signals, making it an ideal choice for interpreting brain signals in various applications. Let's dive into the key components of EEGNet. One of the unique features of EEGNet is its use of depth-wise and separable convolution layers. These layers allow EEGNet to extract meaningful features from EEG signals while minimizing computational complexity. By reducing the number of parameters, EEGNet can work with limited data, making it suitable for scenarios where data availability is a challenge. The depth-wise convolution layer applies a separate convolutional filter to each input channel, capturing spatial information within each channel. This helps EEGNet to effectively model the spatial relationships between different electrodes in the EEG signal. On the other hand, the separable convolution layer further reduces computational complexity by decomposing the convolution operation into two steps, a depth-wise convolution followed by a point-wise convolution. This separation allows EEGNet to capture both spatial and channel-wise information efficiently. Output. The advantages of EEGNet extend beyond its efficient architecture. EEGNet is adaptable to different BCI paradigms, making it a versatile tool for brain signal interpretation. Whether it's medical diagnostics, neurofeedback, or controlling devices using thoughts, EEGNet can be applied to a wide range of applications. In medical diagnostics, EEGNet can help in the detection and classification of various neurological disorders. By analyzing EEG signals, EEGNet can provide valuable insights into conditions such as epilepsy, sleep disorders, and cognitive impairments. Neurofeedback is another area where EEGNet can be beneficial. By analyzing real-time EEG signals, EEGNet can provide feedback to individuals, helping them learn to regulate their brain activity. This can be particularly useful in improving attention, reducing anxiety, and enhancing cognitive performance. Finally, EEGNet can also be used to control devices using thoughts. By decoding EEG signals associated with specific mental tasks, EEGNet can enable individuals to interact with computers, prosthetic devices, or even smart homes using their thoughts as commands. In conclusion, EEGNet is a powerful tool for interpreting brain signals in EEG-based brain-computer interfaces. Its efficient architecture, adaptability to different BCI paradigms, and potential applications in medical diagnostics, neurofeedback, and controlling devices using thoughts make it a valuable asset in the field of brain signal analysis. Welcome to. Okay. So, 
so there, there is a paper published in one of the IEEE journals focusing on the comparison of different deep learning methods uh, for MIBCI, and they use two class MIBCI data sets and two benchmarks, MBT42 and MED62. And they compared the performance of different methods, and you see they compared the accuracy, which is not a correct measure, right? But, uh, and they also put the cutoff, you know, the cutoff, the, the least issue that I talked about it. And they identified the, the significant difference between the EEG net and the other methods. So they, they showed that EEG net is better than the others. However, when you look at the accuracy of different subjects, you can see a, a range of accuracy starting from below the, the line, the lift, and also higher than this. This is one of the issues that is a problematic in MIBCI. So discrepancy for the range of accuracy for different subjects. Even, the, even a method that is successful is not really successful in most of the subjects. And you can see the accuracy of most of them is, is even below 70% in this data set and also in this data set. You can see the, the long range of accuracy. And why it's so different? In, in, no, in, I haven't seen any paper in which the, this issue has been studied. What is the reason? How, how can we model it? Is it possible to model this error and this problem and identify in which subject, which feature is better? They do not do that. So it is one of the issues that we can do with a statistics that we don't like, right? And incorporate it into our analysis. If we analyze it, then we would be able to identify which rhythm is better for which subject, for which condition. Because the conditions are different. A person who is sitting in a room has different conditions than a person who is thinking about something else or walking or, you know, even in the crowded area, it's different based on the issue of the movement uh, planning in the brain. Everything is different. So it would be better if we cooperated. And we can envision, you know, the future of human cognition and technology integration. And we also need to think about the ethical consideration. We cannot easily increase the features. I mean, for example, if you are a data scientist, from the data scientist point of view, you would say, OK, in addition to EEG data, I would use the uh, age or gender information, and I put it in the multimodal classification, right? Then you have the various features. Then you will be, you will have another major problem. Then your device is using electronic health record. And EHR standards are very, very hard to pass. There are five sets of standards written in ISO and IEC, where if, if in which when you are using the electronic health record, even just the age or the gender, then you have to pass cybersecurity, you have to be you have to deal with the inside standard in Europe, in Europe and HIPAA standard from United States to incorporate electronic health record in, because you, you think maybe I can increase the accuracy by 5%, then you will have a five long list of regulatory issues to consider when you want to design your system and sell it in Europe or United States. So we, we really need to think about it. I have also one flow chart, and then we can go. But this is a good news, right? I like it too. <laughs> okay.
you know from the industrial engineering point of view the design has different steps like the first part is the conceptual design i mean most of us pass this you know industrial design course in the university first you have to conceptualize what you want to do and then you have to do the systematic design then after systematic design we will go through the the detailed design then in the black box when in the box that we have the input and output we put the details and then we design different methods and then we have to choose the best design now when you want to go through the best design you need to, uh, to consider the ai regulations as well as one of the design input to your system we usually don't care about it but now it is one of the main design inputs to consider and we have ai risk management ai life cycle all of them would be the design input to your system a very important design input so for for a medical device as a B, MIBCI, when we have conceptual design systematic design detailed design and the selection of the best design now you know that one of the important design input is the ai regulatory input i mean we need to think about it thank you very much no question lunch lunch <laughs> okay I am I'm kidding. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> well, I, mean, that's <laughs> I was kidding. Okay. Okay. Uh, how powerful has been the AI the impact of the results? increasing yes increasing an average of five percent the accuracy yes and in, and increasing the uh, el, the number of problems by 50 percent <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know i'm not really uh, yeah yes you know i'm a, i am an ai engineer i work on ai but I'm not really in favor of using AI for, for, for everything, especially for biopotentials, EEG and EMG. To me, it's the, the most important thing is to identifying the robust features. I don't care about classifier. If the features are robust enough, you can use a simple LDA or KNN classifier. You don't really need to use CNN or this EEG net. I mean, to me, the feature feature engineers because they it's a specific term from the companies they are feature engineers they are the most important part of the company and i don't really think that those ai developers you know those who write code in python and this kinds of stuff it's not the most important part feature is the most important this is what i feel i mean this to, to me is the most important point Yes, the robust feature. Yes. The prima le donne. Yes. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> okay. I will. Uh, sure. Sure. Later. Later, I will. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Give it this. Here. Thank you.
I have a question about the models you presented. Okay, sure. So the question is like, if from the models you've presented, is any of them already been used uh, or been approved uh, in the, through the FDA or for CMARC and is already used as a predicate for other devices and mm -hmm. things that are coming out? Not really. The AI model, not really. They don't use, the ML models, yes. But for AI, I mean, I would say the deep learning models, not yet. Because there are many standards on the way and the, the real fear about the AI uh, approach, scalability, robustness, and even biases. And there are various source of biases in AI model, training and validation. We have a standards for this, for IEEE. And we as you know, AI engineers do not really care about it. They even think about social bias. And we, we don't really implement it. In some countries, we, we, women cannot put, it, put on this, this cap. I mean, sometimes it's really different. I mean, I remember when I was in Alborg and we had a study with Sylvia recording. One of the students was the subject and he wanted to record the EMG's device and we asked him to, to take out his shirt and he said, when a woman is here, I cannot take out my shirt. So we have social bias also. So you, you design your method, uh, uh, for example, 80% of male and 20% of female, and then you want to you want to test it in in another, you know, group of subject. We don't we don't even consider that, but they have thought about this. So briefly, AI model no, but ML model yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for for the talk. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask who are these organisms trying to implement the regulations and if these regulations are more political or technical decisions in oh, they are iso iso and iec and i triple there are three and they are used in uh, uh, they are they are usually used in c marking and fda and uh, i would say that um, maybe from uh, when you when you look at them it's like a political but they are really technical i mean if if you study these materials these these materials are materials that when you implement them you make sure that the quality of the device is proper when you use it it doesn't reduce it's not reduced so the, the, you have to follow them if you want to sell your device. But in research, you, you are not obliged. But Thank they are you. very important. They are not really um, science fiction. You have to consider them. I mean, I didn't know about them when I studied them. Now I, I have been studying all of these ones to, to create a subset of rules for my work because someday, you know, you never know, you want to sell your device, and then when you do not follow this, you, you will have problem in your device. Okay, okay. Just want to add that for these uh, organizations, when they create the standard, there's a committee, there is a bunch of people working in the field. So usually it's companies that work in the field, and different experts on the area. So there might be a bit of a political tension, but it's technical. Those are technical committees. The big companies are part of these groups. All of them are part of, they write the, the standards. Yeah. 